I know that uh, Linda Gray and Wouter Schiewenk are going to be talking about uh, spontaneous leaks, and so I wanted to focus on what I consider to be some of the low-hanging fruit for people with chronic leaks. That group of patients that has a chronic leak following a known dural puncture, which has been underappreciated and underreported, but is increasingly recognized and is perhaps the most amenable of the chronic leaks uh, to treatment. And so important not to miss, and I think an easy group to advocate for as the awareness of chronic leaks grow. So let's get into it. I have no disclosures. Uh, my work at Stanford is supported by the Considine CSF Leaks Fund. Uh, indispensable help for me came from our neurologists and neuroradiologists at Stanford, as well as our neurosurgeons. And uh, I have to say, I don't think we would be doing what we're doing except for the published work of Dr. Shevink as well. Um, so let me tell you about a case that we saw very early on as we started to work with spinal fluid leaks. In July of 2014, a 17-year-old uh, young woman came to Stanford with hip dysplasia and underwent an osteotomy. They attempted to place an epidural catheter for her, and an unintended dural puncture was recognized at the time that the catheter was put in. Interestingly, they did not recognize the accidental dural puncture from fluid flowing back the epidural needle, but when they threaded the catheter and dosed it, they had an unexpectedly dense block, which can happen when you, uh, when you accidentally put a epidural catheter into the intrathecal space. And the only difference between that is a couple of millimeters. An epidural catheter sits outside the bag of fluid. An intrathecal catheter sits inside the bag of fluid. You push that needle just a little too far when you're doing an epidural, and boom, you have penetrated the dura. It was not recognized by the operator during the needle placement. Only afterwards, when the block was much denser than expected, was it recognized. By post-op day three, she was complaining of a headache, not surprisingly. Uh, we know that postural puncture headaches happen. Um, what is of note is that she was also complaining of photophobia and severe nausea and vomiting. And the reason that those symptoms are important in addition to the headache is those are migraineous symptoms, and it would be easy to confuse someone complaining of headache, photophobia, and severe nausea and vomiting as having a migraine, especially a young woman. Uh, fortunately for her, she had no history of migraines or other headache history, and so it was recognized as a postural puncture headache, and she was offered conservative treatment with um, uh, some saline infusion, advised to keep flat as much as possible, which was not hard for her since she'd just undergone hip surgery, and it was noted in the chart, if the postural puncture headache does not improve with the above, we will consider an epidural blood patch. All seems well. We should note that things might have seemed different if she had a prior history of migraine, which would not be unlikely. This is the age-specific prevalence of migraine, and what you see is in a 20-year-old young woman, the age-specific prevalence of migraine is between 20 and 30 percent. And so there was between a one in five and one in three chance that when this happened to this young woman, she might have had a previous history of migraine. And if she did have a previous history of migraine and the dural puncture wasn't recognized by the operator, a headache after surgery with nausea and vomiting and photophobia might well have been ascribed to a migraineous problem. And you might think that that's unlikely, but I'm gonna show you some data that that in fact happens. So I said, you know, she's diagnosed with postural puncture headache, and that should be obvious. But in fact, if you look at one study that looked at postpartum headaches in women who had undergone spinals and epidurals, um, you can see this is, a, this is from Goldsmith et al. in 2005, where they looked at a prospective cohort of 985 women who underwent, uh, lab who underwent labor and delivery and um, subsequently had headaches and how the headaches were categorized. And what I want to point out to you is that although 18 of the 985 women were diagnosed as having postural puncture headache, they noted that 81 of the 381 women with headaches, or 21% of all the women with headaches, actually reported symptomatic relief when supine. So even though for every one case of postural puncture headache that they actually diagnosed, there were four additional cases who had orthostatic headaches relieved when supine, 
the majority of those were not diagnosed with postural puncture headache. Because of other features of the headache, they were diagnosed with other things, most commonly tension type or migrainous headache. And so even in the setting where someone has had a known needle in the back and has an orthostatic headache, often people are in fact diagnosed with other kinds of headaches. And in fact, in this cohort, four out of five of those with orthostatic postural headaches in the setting of having had a needle in the back the day before were diagnosed with some other kind of headache. So let's get back to our patient. By post-op day four, it was noted in her chart, since the patient has improved from yesterday and is able to walk around the room and the minimal three out of 10 pain, we will continue to follow symptoms, but will defer placement of an epidural blood patch at this time. Anticipate she will continue to improve without intervention. This is a total standard of care maneuver in someone with a postural puncture headache who is improving. It is part of the standard of care that you can pursue conservative treatment with hydration, caffeine, NSAIDs, with the expectation that some significant proportion of them will just resolve on their own. So what happened then? Well, the Republicans took control of the Senate during the 2014 midterm elections here in the United States. There was deflate gate in the NFL where the, the New England Patriots were accused of inappropriately deflating balls to improve reception. Charlie Hebdo was attacked in Paris. The Apple Watch went on sale for the first time. The Supreme Court in the United States ruled that bans on gay marriage were unconstitutional and Donald Trump declared his candidacy for the presidency. Months and months went by. 14 months later, our patient is referred to the Stanford Pain Clinic for quote unquote fibromyalgia, complaining of pain uh, in her total back, lower, greater than upper, interesting, low back pain, uh, just started uh, every day with physical activity. And in the note when she was seen at the Stanford Pain Clinic, it was noted chronic headaches, which started after an epidural catheter placement. The headache is bifrontal, achy, worsened by stress and anxiety and alleviated by laying down. Okay, so we're all thinking about CSF League at this point, but it should also be noted, this is associated with lightheadedness with standing, nausea and shortness of breath with walking upstairs. A young woman with lightness and lightheadedness upon standing, nausea and shortness of breath walking upstairs often gets referred to neurology and starts getting worked up for POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So she was lucky that it was noted that uh, this had started after an epidural catheter placement. This is what her MRI looks like. So on the left, you see the sagittal image. There is no clear, obvious brain sag. Um, and uh, on the right, you can see her post-contrast coronal imaging shows no PACI meningeal enhancements. Her MRI was read at Stanford by a number of very good neuroradiologists who reported this MRI as normal. This is what a CSF leak in the classic sense is usually look like. This is the, the classic um, PACI meningeal enhancement wrapping all around the temporal lobes. And this is what her MRI looked like, showing none of that thick, smooth PACI meningeal enhancement. Her spine MRI is here. It was also read as normal. Note at that time, even though we were looking for CSF leaks at Stanford, we did not always necessarily have good fat suppression in our images. And so you see her subcutaneous fat here. And in fact, you can see what is uh, probably epidural fat, but you can't be 100% sure because the, this is not fat suppressed. Maybe that's in fact water like here. But nonetheless, the spine MRI was read as normal. Her brain MRI was read as normal. And the question then becomes, should you stop or offer epidural patching? And some of this comes down to how sensitive do you believe uh, a MRI is for detecting a leak? And in particular, for detecting a chronic post-puncture leak, which has not been examined in the literature at all. There are no studies looking at patients with chronic post-puncture leaks evaluating uh, the rate of positive or negative findings on MRI. So what should you do in the face of ambiguity? Well, the international, um, uh, the IHS classification, the International classification, classification of Headache Disorders, now in version three, uh, says that for low pressure type headaches, uh, in patients with typical orthostatic headache, and 
no apparent cause, and after exclusion of POTS, it is reasonable in clinical practice to provide autologous lumbar epidural blood batch. And so even if someone does not meet these pre-specified criteria that they put forward, which are basically that you have to have an opening pressure of less than six or positive imaging. So they put forward these criteria for saying, this is what you need in order to diagnose somebody. They then go on and say, but if you've got a typical orthostatic headache and you can't identify a cause and you've ruled out POTS, it's reasonable in clinical practice to provide an autologous lumbar epidural blood patch. And this should be important to the viewers in Canada because here's an international organization that's put forward a consensus statement saying, even if you don't meet the criteria for low pressure headache as defined by an opening pressure less than six and positive imaging, in this clinical setting, it's reasonable to offer epidural patching. Uh, and they go on to say complete relief of symptoms may not be achieved until two or more epidural blood patches have been performed. We did go forward and offer epidural blood patching. This is what she looks like after two epidural blood patches. This is my colleague, Dr. Cow, who actually, to his credit, his great credit, when she came in 14 months after um, her dural puncture, she did not relate it to the dural puncture. She had forgotten that she had a dural puncture. Um, it was him going through her medical records, seeing that, in fact, uh, she had had this dural puncture um, that first made the connection. And how many people really go through the medical records uh, of 14 months before someone presents to their clinic? Um, however, new research suggests that the brain MRI findings in CSF leak are more subtle than that pachymeningeal enhancement I showed you. Um, Jürgen Beck and his group in Bern, Switzerland, um, uh, put forward uh, a new set of criteria that are being referred to in papers that are coming out now as the Bern criteria in JAMA Neurology last year. And what they did is, is they looked at MRI findings in patients uh, who were being evaluated with orthostatic headaches, and uh, they looked at healthy control MRIs and then they looked at differences between those MRIs at what predicted subsequently finding positive findings on a CT myelogram. And what they found was that in addition to the pachymeningeal enhancement I showed you, which does significantly predict the likelihood of having a positive CT myelogram, there are a number of other findings that significantly predict the likelihood your spinal imaging will be positive and that you have a CSF leak. And among them are what are being called the supercellar distance between the pituitary and the optic chiasm, the mammalopontine distance between the mammillary body and the top of the pons, and the prepontine distance between the clivus and the pons. And each of these was independently predictive of the likelihood of having a positive subsequent spine imaging in a CT myelogram. So what they found was, yes, some of the classic signs of a CSF leak uh, kind of popularized in the mnemonic SEEPS by Dr. Shevink uh, do in fact predict the likelihood of having positive spinal imaging, in particular venous engorgement, pachymeningeal enhancement, subdural fluid collections. But that supercellar cistern, that distance between the top of the pituitary and the optic chiasm, if that's less than four millimeters, the odds of you having a positive CT myelogram proving a leak is 32. You're 32 times more likely to have a positive CT myelogram than someone who has a normal supercellar distance. If you have reduced fluid in front of the pons, between the pons and the clivus, less than five millimeters, you're four times more likely to have a leak. Mammalopontine distance less than 6.5 millimeters, you're three times more likely to have a leak. So let's look at our patient again. This was her MRI that was read as normal before that paper came out. If we look closely at the distance between the top of the pituitary and the optic chiasm, you see that it is in fact two millimeters. And that means that her MRI, which was read as normal, actually indicates a 32 times greater likelihood of her having a leak. Uh, 
And so it's not diagnostic for a leak, but it means that she has a 32 times greater chance of having a leak demonstrated on spinal imaging than someone who doesn't have this finding. That doesn't mean everybody with this finding has a leak. It's not diagnostic, but it means that we probably should be getting away from thinking of this kind of brain imaging as diagnostic. It either increases or decreases your pretest probability of having a leak, but it doesn't necessarily give you the answer to do you have a leak. In this case, this finding suggests that after having this MRI, the likelihood of having a leak is substantially higher. I'll tell you about another case, a 35-year-old woman with a family history of brain cancer living in Mississippi. Because of this, she was having routine brain scans, probably shouldn't have been having. She was found to have a white matter lesion on a scan, and there was concern for multiple sclerosis. She had a spinal tap in 2011 due to finding one of these white matter lesions. It turned out she did not have MS, but after the spinal tap, she developed a spinal headache, 10 out of 10. She had a blood patch the next day. She was headache-free for a month or so. Um, note that before she had the spinal tap, she was having a headache maybe twice a week, and they were not so bad. But she went on with her life. In 2013, she had an epidural with the vaginal birth of her second child. Her headaches worsened substantially. And by 2018 or 2019, she was having debilitating headaches every day. She was treated locally in Mississippi here in the United States. A blood patch in 2018, she felt was, quote, really good. She woke up headache-free for three weeks, and then uh, her headaches returned, but they, had, they were not so debilitating as they had been before. She had another blood patch in 2018, July, September 2018, again, giving several weeks of relief, but then recurrent symptoms. This is what her 48-hour flat test looked like. The 48-hour flat test is simply a uh, way of measuring orthostatic symptoms that we've been using at Stanford. It is not prospectively validated. We have not, and no one else has yet proven that it in fact predicts the likelihood of benefiting from a patch. But what it is, is a way of quantifying the degree to which you have, or a patient has, orthostatic symptoms. And basically, we ask patients to rate their head pain, neck pain, nausea, cognitive symptoms, tinnitus, and fatigue. After they've been upright all day, typically on a Friday night, we then ask them to go lay down as they would on a Friday night. Um, but when they wake up on Saturday morning, they get up, they go to the bathroom, they get back to being flat. Uh, and they stay flat all day Saturday so that we can see um, are there typical worsened headaches late in the day, in fact, a function of circadian rhythm or posture? So they stay flat all day Saturday. They go to bed again Saturday night. Sunday, same thing. They get up, they go pee, they get back to being flat. And then sometime around five o'clock on Sunday, they rate their symptoms again. You know, what has happened to their head pain? What has happened to their neck pain? What has happened to their nausea by staying flat? Then we have them get up, walk around for two hours, rate their symptoms again, giving you a kind of multi-dimensional measure of the degree to which they have symptoms that are in fact common in CSF leak and the extent to which they are um, postural. This is what that PDF can look like. And after 48 hours flat, this is what her MRI looked like. Her MRI was read again as normal. There is no pachymeningeal enhancement. There's no obvious brain sag. But if we look at that measurements from uh, that paper in JAMA Neurology of what is being called the burn criteria, supracellar distance doesn't meet their criteria. It's greater than four, but their mammalopontine distance is less than 6.5, increasing the odds of positive spinal imaging and having a CSF leak, their prepontine distance is less than five, again, increasing the odds that there really is a spinal CSF leak. This is what the image looks like from the original dural puncture uh, that caused the problem. Um, and this is the lateral. And I suspect that, in fact, here, with where this tip is, they've punctured the ventral dural. What does that mean? It means that I think they've done this. They've gone through. They put a puncture in the dorsal dura to get into the fecal sac, but I think they went a little further than they probably wanted to, and they may well have put a hole in the ventral dura. So now they have a hole here, and they have a hole here. Why is that important? This is an image published by Dr. Shevink of what a myelogram can look like after an epidural blood patch. And what you see here is 
here's the dorsal dura, here's the spinal cord, the vertebral body, and somebody's had a blood patch here, and what you see is, is all of the blood is in fact uh, confined to the dorsal epidural space. It's in fact, it would be great for that dorsal puncture, but none of this is in fact making it around to the ventral surface where it could patch a ventral puncture. So again, if we think that there's a leak here, ventrally, one of the things we've got to do is try to get some blood or glue there, and that would be accomplished by this kind of approach called a transferaminal approach. And this is what this looks like on fluoroscopy. I've heard people say at conferences that this can only be done on CT, but in fact, it is easily done on fluoroscopy. Here is a needle put in the dorsal epidural space where we have contrast spreading in the dorsal epidural space. Here's another needle coming in transferaminally, and what you can see is contrast spreading right on the front of the disc here in the ventral epidural space. How common are these problems? So one of my colleagues here at Stanford, Pam Flood, was an obstetric anesthesiologist before doing pain medicine, and she published this paper when she was working on the labor and delivery unit at Columbia University in New York City. And what she did is she looked at 40 women who had known accidental dural punctures and 40 for labor and delivery, and 40 women who had uh, epidurals placed the same day for labor and delivery without an accidental dural puncture. So 40 control women who underwent labor and delivery with an epidural without an accidental puncture, and 40 women who underwent the same procedure for the same reason, who differed only by the fact that the needle was accidentally placed a little too far, and they were given a dural puncture. And what you see here is, if you're in the control group of the women who had uh, no accidental dural puncture, and you're contacted 12 to 24 months later, the likelihood of you reporting a new chronic headache following your delivery is about 5%. But if you had an accidental dural puncture, if you're in that group of 40 women who had accidental dural punctures, their rate of having a new chronic headache was 28%, almost one in three. If in fact, you had an accidental dural puncture and you were offered a blood patch, your rate of having a new chronic headache was 20%, which is half as much as if you were measured, if you were um, treated conservatively. So like my first patient, the 17 year old girl who got no blood patch, the rate of having new chronic headache was 40%, almost one in two. Now, one of the things that's important is to realize here that an epidural blood patch managing that postural puncture headache was protective it decreased the likelihood of having a new chronic headache by half. But these patients who had an accidental dural puncture and had a epidural blood patch still have a four times higher rate of having new chronic headaches compared to the controls that were 5%. All right, well, maybe that's just Pam Flood. It's a small study, 40 cases, 40 controls, but this has been subsequently reproduced by Rangathan, um, who looked at 308 unintended dural punctures and compared them to 50 controls. The only difference here is that instead of looking out at 12 to 24 months, they looked out at six weeks. But what you see is their data is essentially identical to the data found by Flood and colleagues who uh, found in this study, again, if you had no accidental dural puncture, the rate of having new chronic headaches at six weeks was 2.1%. But again, if you had an accidental dural puncture, the rate of having new chronic headaches is about one in three, 34%. And in both this study and Pam Flood study, what you see is that in addition, if you have an epidural without a dural puncture, the likelihood of having new chronic pain in your back is very low, 4.3%. But if you have an accidental dural puncture and you have CSF escaping, the likelihood of having chronic back symptoms is really high, about 50 to 60%. And this was found in Dr. Flood's study too, suggesting that CSF escaping from the fecal sac is in fact irritating to the surrounding tissues. Both of those were retrospective studies. Last year, a prospective study was published in Headache. Uh, where they looked at 45 patients over 18 months who had suffered an accidental dural puncture during a labor epidural. And uh, what they found was of the 39 patients who completed follow-up, 
30% reported persistent headache at 18 months. So what you see now is two retrospective studies finding this, now a prospective study finding this. There is in fact, coming out in the next couple of weeks, another prospective study finding essentially the same thing, that if you have an accidental dural puncture, the likelihood of you developing chronic symptoms is something around 30%. And so they concluded in headache that postdural puncture headache from an accidental dural puncture can no longer be considered a self-limiting condition. These are not the first studies that have found this. A number of older studies, including this one, and this one also found the rate of chronic headaches after known dural punctures. And the question becomes, why does this happen? Here is uh, an image from a CT myelogram of a patient of ours at Stanford who had an accidental dural puncture during the placement of an epidural stimulating lead for a condition called complex regional pain syndrome, where they put a wire outside the fecal sac to deliver electricity to try to help reduce pain. And you can see here, here's the wire uh, after the stim put in. But during her attempted placement of the stim, they created an accidental dural puncture and she developed chronic headaches afterwards. We couldn't figure out what was going on. And in this myelogram, what you see is this little bleb that has formed on the dorsal dura where she had her dural puncture. Her dura, when it sealed, did not go back to the way it was before she had been punctured. She had this little friable bleb now, and we would patch this and she would get better for several weeks and then our symptoms would come back. And so one reason why an epidural blood patch might not work is because you in fact can get uh, a change in the anatomy. And she had this friable bleb. That's what it looks like a little bigger. Again, this friable bleb with contrast inside it. This is what it looks like during surgery. This, this is all dura. All this messy bread stuff is lamina and muscle that have been cut away. This is her dura. And this is the little bleb. And this is what it looks like after surgery. Just tying off that little bleb. And that woman subsequently went on to med school. So what can you do? Um, the first thing you can do is you can prevent this kind of thing from happening, but why by what are called atraumatic tip needles. If you're going to undergo a CT myelogram or a lumbar puncture, you should be asking that the needle has an atraumatic tip. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. We should be using smaller gauge needles. If we're using a cutting needle, the bevel should be turned. I think as physicians, we need to avoid conservative management of postural puncture headache. Um, when somebody has a known dural puncture, we should be offering them patches. We should be treating this aggressively and invasively rather than just watching them. And the reason is my follow-up isn't good enough and neither is yours. Don't assume uh, that the history will distinguish postural puncture headache and migraine uh, going forward, that this will always be easy to tell 14 months away from a known dural puncture. These are what different kinds of needles look like. This quinky needle is in fact the kind of needle with a cutting bevel that is found in most lumbar puncture trays around the United States and I suspect around Canada, even though it is now well proven that these kinds of needles that have this window uh, kind of displaced backward from a non-cutting tip either a Gertie Marx, a Sprott, or a Whitaker, cause markedly lower rates of postural puncture headache. This is another view of it. Here's the Sprott needle, which appears to have the lowest rate of chronic headaches after dural puncture. Whitaker also better, but not possibly, possibly not quite as good as Sprott. And these other kinds of needles that cause um, uh, cutting and higher rates of dural puncture, this quinky type. There's good data that switching to atraumatic needles improves outcome. This is from one of our neurology journals uh, where it was a study of 651 patients in neurologic practice undergoing a lumbar puncture during the switch from a 22 gauge cutting needle to a 25 gauge, which means smaller uh, gauge non-cutting needle, atraumatic needle. And this switch reduced postural puncture headaches it reduced hospitalizations among the patients, days of work missed, it reduced blood patches needed, and strangely, it also reduced the number of attempts 
and the failure rate of the procedure. This has been found in other studies as well, and there is now a meta-analysis in the Lancet of 110 randomized control trials, uh, finding that postural puncture headache occurred in 11% of the traumatic needle groups and only 4.2% of the atraumatic needle group. It is now proven beyond a reasonable doubt that in fact, use of these atraumatic needles decreases postural puncture headache. And the Lancet article also found no increased rate in procedural failure. The neurologists out there need to be using atraumatic needles for their lumbar punctures. This is a um, uh, another article talking about how we as doctors need to change practice now using atraumatic needles to prevent lumbar puncture. And so, um, I'm going to go and uh, finish here and ask um, that the doctors out there commit to changing your practice using only pencil point needles. When you suspect a CSF leak, that you use the 48-hour flat test to document the nature of symptoms and their postural nature and have a low threshold as advocated by the International Classification for Headache Disorders um, a low threshold for epidural blood patch in the appropriate clinical context. And I think that these kinds of postural puncture headaches, these chronic post-puncture headaches, are the low-hanging fruit. Most often the dural puncture is on the dorsal dura and therefore is amenable to being patched. It's almost invariably a puncture in the lumbar spine where anesthesiologists are most comfortable doing a patch. Um, and it is an extension of what anesthesiologists already recognize. They recognize that postural puncture headaches occur and they need to be patched. They just aren't so aware that sometimes people can really have chronic symptoms. And that's why I bring these references to your attention. Um, I'll share them with uh, the, the, um, with the organization uh, after my talk so that they can post them and post the references uh, so that if someone out there uh, sees this talk and they think they have a chronic postural puncture headache, they can pull up the references and pull up the statement from the International Classification of Headache uh, Disorders and say, hey, listen, there's real data that these problems do in fact become chronic. There's people out there saying that we should offer a clinical uh, a clinically warranted patch, even in the absence of positive confirmatory imaging. And um, you don't need an MRI or a CT myelogram. You just need a trial of patching. And I think that's accessible both here in the United States and Canada. It's the low hanging fruit that offers and challenges the physicians to extend what they already do just a little bit. It's not the same, it's not the same thing as asking an anesthesiologist to, um, to do a cervical epidural blood patch on someone whose imaging is equivocal or negative. This is uh, something where you really compare a clinical context to, um, to a need to offer a therapy that is already well accepted uh, and just to have people believe that the symptoms can in fact become chronic. And with that, I will go ahead and finish and um, uh, take any questions.